Okay. So, let me try to hit the right one back. Okay. So, this is the original classic cookie monster, uh, not the modernized version. This is the one who is always willing to eat cookies. That will be important later today, potentially, depending on where you go. There's a cookie monster from Maryland. Isn't he a Muppet? Yes. Jim yes. Jim oh, yes. And I know at the Smithsonian, at least as of about a month ago, you can see one of the original come at the farts. And just your, your what, there's a really nice little bit there. All right. Out of curiosity, has anybody here seen a mono variant before? Okay, a few of us. And I will do it either with or without a dash just to make sure you're paying attention. So what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about what a mono variant is. I want to show you some standard problems where you can use this to solve. And then I want to talk about some research problems that I've done with students. I will end with a open problem, which if you can solve, I will give you $500. If you want $1,000, you can probably convince me to do $1,000. Uh, it involves a game I created to try to get my kids excited about mathematics. By my kids, I mean my actual kids, not my students. I want to beat my daughter. And so it's worth money to me to come up with a strategy. And you know, if you think that this is unfair, she's allowed to talk to her friends. And you know, she can give talks in this as well. All right. So you've hopefully seen an invariant. This is a quantity that's unchanged throughout a process. Uh, a monovariant is a quantity that only changes in one direction. It either always goes up and, or stays the same, or it always goes down and stays the same. Can somebody give me a quantity related to yourself that only moves in one direction? Age. Age, okay. Can you give me a quantity that can go both up and down? Weight, right. And in fact, if you want to change yours in one direction, there are some very nice pastries just around the bend. So there's a lot of quantities that can go in both directions. Quantities that only move in one direction are often very useful in mathematics and physics. Not surprisingly, they show up in a lot of uh, competition problems. I know this is a campus which is phenomenal, at least right now, for doing well in competitions. Being aware of monovariance is a great way to get a variety of problems. Wonderful collection open over here. The difficulty is it's often unclear what is the right monovariant to use. So if you've ever taken a class where you're doing convergence tests and trying to figure out which test to use, you know, it's often not clear if you want to use the comparison test, well, what should I compare it to? Sometimes divine inspiration strikes, but the comparison test is a lot harder to use than the ratio of the root test where, well, okay, I just take this limit. It's much more constructive, All right? So what I want to do is I want to talk about zombies, and so the way it works is the following. If you share a wall with two or more zombies, you become infected, you become a zombie, and you are a zombie for the rest of your life. So for example, imagine I have a square grid and I have three initial places where there are zombies. So if you share two walls with a zombie, you become a zombie, and then are a zombie for all eternity. We'll count row one, row two, row three, row four. I apologize to the computer scientists for starting at one and not zero. Can anybody tell me who becomes infected in the next round? Yes. 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 And is anybody else infected in the first motion? Okay, so just those two get infected. So one unit of time later, these two are infected. Does anybody get infected at the next stage? Yes, in the back. You want to try it as to who might get infected? So two. Whoa. Which which for well, well, Okay. Is this row one or row four? That's right. Okay, so you're doing the opposite. Okay, so row two. Hopefully, yes, this gets infected, anybody else? And this one over here, excellent. And so I think the pattern is pretty clear. The next one, uh, once these are infected, you would get those two over there. And does anybody else get infected? No, so at this point, the zombie apocalypse has stabilized. All right. We've lost, unfortunately, a majority of our you know, country to the zombies, but we at least have you know, a nice little L shape where we can live safely. So am I allowed to use strong language here? Yeah. Okay, so 
<laughs> I'm going to go with your first answer of yes. So I want the easiest initial state that will ensure that at some point in time, everyone is infected. The easiest. I want you to be a smart ass. If you're not willing to do that, please lower your hand. Are you willing to be a, yeah. okay. Give me the easiest initial state. The easiest, easiest. No, 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 easiest. Thank you. Yes. This is the easiest initial state where it is very clear that at some point in time, everyone will be infected, right? If you start off with everybody infected, it's not that hard to show. In fact, I can even tell you how long you have to wait. <laughs> What's the next easiest? Yes, you could remove one, right? And you could go a little bit further. Instead of removing one, I could maybe remove like a checkerboard pattern. But if you look at this, I still have 50% of the squares infected. So you know, it's a great savings, but it's still you know, on order, N squared infected cells initially. So now can you give me a better suggestion? So now if we do the diagonal, and this seems to be a little bit of a delay as it sends it from the iPad to the laptop and then the laptop to the screen. So I will try to then uh, time things in a little bit in advance. So if we infect the diagonal, then what you can see is one moment in time later, it's going to expand out and get the diagonals above and below. And then as you keep going like this, it's going to slowly, slowly, slowly keep increasing until eventually everybody's infected. And you can tell exactly how long it's going to take. It's just going to be the number of diagonals I need to get to the very end. Okay. And so the diagonal is great. Is it possible? to infect everybody on an n by n square with fewer than n initial infected cells. Can anybody do it with n minus one? Uh, okay, so one thing is to try some configurations. Yes. Oh, but the answer is no because if a row oh. doesn't have something. In okay, it. I don't want to jump to the answer, but <laughs> so you're going to conjecture no. Okay, yeah. okay, and then there was also a suggestion that maybe we can do it if maybe we take certain configurations. What's the easiest end to investigate? One, right? Start easy. Let's build up some intuition. So we look at the one by one square and we can infect no one. Okay, it's pretty clear that no one's going to be infected. If we do the two by two, well, we can only infect one square. By symmetry, it doesn't really matter which one we choose. We see that there's no way the infection can spread. If we look at the three by three case, and you can use this uh, if you ever want to play tic-tac-toe against little kids and you know, take them down, you know, how many opening moves are there in tic-tac-toe? Well, up to symmetry, there's only three opening moves in tic-tac-toe. You can do a corner, you can do a middle, you can do a center. And then for each one of these, you can look at how many responses do you have. And so if I could only infect two cells out of three, there's five cases to consider here, five here, and only two here. And you'll very quickly see that when n equals one, two, or three, there's no way to get everybody infected. And so now you might begin to believe, as has been conjectured, that there is no way that everyone will be infected. So I don't know if this is what you're about to suggest, a perimeter approach. I was going to say that if you, oh, wait, what I was going to say was wrong, actually. Okay. There might be a way to save it, so we should talk afterwards. So a lot of this subject about monovariance, finding these quantities that move only in one direction, it's an art form. It's trying to find what's the right object to look at. And so the insight here is let's look at the perimeter of the infection. Let's look at the perimeter, the outside boundary of who's infected. So imagine I have two cells infected over here. And these two cells are not infected. So this wall over here is an external wall. This is an external wall over here. But these other two horizontal ones, you know, I have nothing there yet. When I infect the cell in between, I've lost two external walls. They've now become eternal, internal. But I've gained two external walls. So there's no net change in the perimeter of the infection. I could, instead of having two horizontal ones like this, I could have two ones you're forming like a little corner like this. And again, I'm going to lose 
two external walls and gain two external walls. There's no net change in infection. And by symmetry, these are the only configurations I need to consider when two of the four neighbors are infected. I now have to look at, well, what if there were three neighbors that are infected? Well, without loss of generality, I might as well assume it's like this. I now lose three walls and I only gain one. So the perimeter went down by two. And of course, the other case is if there are four infected, then I lose four walls and the perimeter goes down by four. So no matter what, the perimeter, as, the, as time passes, as the zombies evolve, or not evolve, uh, the perimeter never increases. It either stays the same or goes down by two, it goes down by four. Well, if I have n minus one infected cells initially, the maximum perimeter I can have is four times n minus one or four n minus four. And so again, since the perimeter never increases, what's going to happen is since the perimeter of n by n square is four n and the maximum initial perimeter is four n minus four, there must be at least one square safe. So there's at least one safe place to be, no matter what the infection configuration is at the start. Can anybody prove that there's something better than just one safe square? It's obviously, you can take off another one because you can't get one. Right. So if there was only one safe square, every square has at least two neighbors. So even though I only can prove right now that there's one safe square, we know there has to be at least two. So I don't want to talk about this out loud. So I'll leave this as a challenge. Can you take this and propagate that there must be a column or a row somewhere that's safe? You know, we saw that in the initial configuration that it missed both a row and a column, we were lucky. Will you always have something like that? All we know is initially there has to be one safe place, but as time passes, it's got to propagate. So I really love this problem in that you prove just a little bit. And once you have that, you can milk it for so much more. Okay. So I've been talking with some people about the amazing John Conway. I was fortunate enough to be a graduate student at Princeton when he was there. A wonderful person, phenomenal view of mathematics. If he wanted to give a 45 part series of mathematics of belly lint, he would find incredible connections between. He could take the strangest things and see the deepest mathematics. So what I want to talk about is the Conway checkerboard or a soldier problem. And the way it works is uh, financial times are good. We have a checkerboard that's infinite by infinite. Uh, for practical purposes, I'm only going to draw a finite analog of it. But imagine it extends infinitely to the left, to the right, down, and up. This is going to be, um, I think, row 0, row negative 1, row negative 2, row negative 3, and so on. And I have a checker everywhere. And the way it works is checkers can go either vertically or horizontally. And if you jump over a piece, you remove that piece and you move up. And that's the only way checkers can move. You either jump over something vertically or you jump over something horizontally. All right. Is everybody clear on the moves? And so I have just gotten a piece one unit above where I started. Can anybody give me a series of moves that would allow me to have a piece two units above in row two? OK, yes. Yep, I saw you nodding, so you're. Yeah, I mean, you don't move like, like, to the right. Like, it's, like, yep. Like, so I saw this one jumps up. No, no, oh. no, no, no. Like, they, like, so they Oh, okay. Move this over. So have this one jump to the left and then, and then have that jump up. Excellent. So you've given me a configuration that will allow me to have someone jump up. There's lots of ways to do this. If you don't want to be efficient, inefficient ways, you could have two things jump up, then this could jump over, and then this could jump. There's lots of ways you can do it. Your way is efficient. My way has more depth. You know, it's, either way is fine. Do you think you can do three? Do you think you can do four? Do you think you can do five? Do you think you can do, how high do you think you can get a checker? And so what Conway did is he introduced a beautiful monovariant. And so we're gonna define it as follows. So I am from Boston, as you can probably tell from the accent. I hate giving credit to New York City, but I have to give credit to one part of New York City. And I'm not talking about sports. 
what part of New York City does something very well? Math Museum. Math Museum. In terms of transportation. Subway. Subway. Um, I'm sorry? Taxi cabs. Which part of New York City is very nice to move around in? Manhattan, why? It's a grid. Yo, I love Boston, but you have roads that flip as to which one is above the other as you're traveling the two roads. You, know, you, you, you have parallel roads that intersect and then are parallel again. So here, what we're going to do is we're going to have a target square that's going to be five units above. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to assign a value to every square, and it's going to be using the Manhattan metric. I count how many horizontal steps do I need to take and how many vertical steps do I need to take to get to you? So if it's I horizontal and J vertical, I'm gonna give you a weight of X to the I plus J. So this is going to have a weight of one because it's gonna be X to the zero. I'm already here. Uh, these four next will all be X. It takes two steps to get here, it takes two steps to get there. So those will be X squared and so on. Right now I have complete freedom in terms of choosing what X is. And what we're going to do is we're going to see that if we choose the right value for x, we're going to get a monovariant for the value of the board. And we will then be able to show that it's impossible to get a checker that high, is that we're going to show that the value of the board never increases as the game evolves. We'll calculate what is the initial value if everything is filled in over here. What would the value be if we had one piece over here and that value will be too high? Um, and if you've never seen this before, a really interesting number is going to emerge, which initially should have nothing to do with this problem. Okay, so what we're going to do is the following. Let's calculate the value of the zeroth row. Well, the zeroth row, um, you know, we start off over here, x, x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth, x to the fifth. Then we have 2x to the sixth, 2x to the seventh, 2x to the eighth, and so on. So if I want to figure out what is the value of the zeroth row, it's going to be dot to dot x to the seventh, x to the sixth, x to the fifth, x to the sixth, x to the seventh. So it's x to the fifth plus twice the following sum. Well, that's just a geometric series. You know, I'm just starting with my first term is x to the sixth rather than one. All right, so without too much trouble, I put in the geometric series formula. You know, the ratio is going to be fine as long as what's true about x. So what do I need to be true about x? Less than one. So as long as x is less than one, okay, so I now have my first constraint about x. As long as x is less than one, then I'm going to assign a finite value to the zero row. And this is this infinite plane. Yes. And so the zero row now has a value of one plus x times x to the fifth over one minus x. Can anybody tell me quickly what would be the value of the negative first row? knowing the value of the zeroth row. Yes, it's x times that because everything is just shifted down one more vertical step. And if I go down two rows, it'll be x squared times that. So each row is just x times the previous. And so I now get a geometric series times that. And when the dust settles and you do a little bit of algebra, you get one plus x times x to the fifth over one minus x squared. And that's gonna be the initial value of the board. And I can choose any value of x that I want. Well, there are two types of moves I can do. I can lose two pieces and add a new piece that's further from t, or I could lose two pieces and add a piece that's closer to t. Well, the further away you are, the smaller the value you're going to be because x is less than one, I'm gonna have x to a higher power. So if I lose two pieces, and replace them with a piece that's further away, I've clearly decreased the value of the board. So the only thing I have to worry about is what if I take two pieces and do a jump and end up with a piece that's now closer? Could the value of the board have gone up? And so what I can do is let's just look for definiteness at, let's say I have something at x to the sixth, x to the fifth, and I jump and I have something at x to the fourth. With a little bit of inspection, you can see all the calculations will be the same. So the change is I now have something at x to the fourth. I subtract off what I had started with, x to the fifth, x to the sixth, and I get x to the fourth times one minus x minus x squared. Well, if I make this equal to zero, then there's no net change to the value of the board. So this is just a quadratic that I have to solve. Does anybody recognize either this quadratic 
or its cousin. Yes. It's related to the goal of issue. Normally you do x squared minus x minus one. So it's essentially like one over is the transformation. And so this is essentially related to the golden mean and the Fibonacci numbers. And so when we try to solve this, we get x equals um, negative one plus or minus root five over two. Um, we want the positive root. And so we get you know, basically the golden mean minus one, and that will be a number less than one. So if we choose this to be x, then every time we do a move, the value of the board either stays the same or goes down. And now we can use this to analyze the problem. So we choose our target point T. The initial broad value, when we put in x equals root five minus one over two is one. If we want to put a target at zero four, if we want to try to go up four units. Well, we calculate what would that value be? It would be 0.618. That's less than one. It's possible that if I start with this infinite board that's filled and I do a bunch of moves, I could end up with something four units above because that doesn't violate. That doesn't prove it's possible. It just proves that it's not inconsistent. If, however, I want my target to be at zero five, the board's initial value must be at least one. Well, the board's value is exactly one. So the only way I could get something at zero five is if every piece is removed and I'm left with the dust settling with a piece at, more, at zero five and nowhere else. So at the very least, it's impossible to do this in finite time. Um, I'm not gonna bother making the slide small so that you can see the little footnote over here. It turns out that there's a generalization of this game where you are allowed to do infinitely many moves at once if they're the right number of infinitely many moves. And if you do that, then it is possible to get something to zero five in a finite number of moves. But of course, you're not doing infinitely many moves at once. Only do the standard game. This is a wonderful proof that you cannot get anything to zero five. That by looking at this right monovariant, and that's the difficulty is you've got to figure out what is the right thing to look at. And that's where the artwork comes into play. And so what I want to do now is I want to pivot to a research area of mine. I do a lot of work with Fibonacci numbers. And I love doing projects with students on these. You know, we've done projects both in my standard RVU and the polymath because the prerequisites needed are extremely minimal. And you can see lots of fascinating, interesting relationships. And so what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about the Fibonacci numbers. So is there anybody here who can start to be citing Fibonacci numbers for me? Okay, so you're starting one, one, two, three. Did anybody give me another start of Fibonacci numbers? Zero, one, one, two, three. And there's another way to start the Fibonacci numbers. One, two, three. So there's three different ways. We can get into good fights as to what's the best way to define the Fibonacci's. I am going to argue that the best way to define the Fibonacci's is to go one, two, three, five. And the reason is Zeckendorf's theorem. Every positive integer can be written uniquely as a sum of non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers. Well, if you allow two ones, then you lose uniqueness. If you allow a zero, you lose uniqueness. So if I define my Fibonacci numbers like this, it turns out every number can be written uniquely as a sum of non-adjacent Fibonacci numbers. So I probably should have updated this from the last time you've heard the talk, because it's now 2023. Uh, the last time you heard the talk was 2022. And so you know, the way you prove this, or at least one way you prove this, is the greedy algorithm. Take your number and throw away the largest Fibonacci number you can. Look at what's left over, throw away the largest Fibonacci number you can. If you happen to throw away two Fibonacci numbers that were adjacent, then you're an idiot. Because the, the sum of two Fibonacci numbers that are adjacent is just the next Fibonacci number. So each term is the sum of the previous two. So if these two numbers were adjacent, this isn't the largest number I could have thrown away. I could have thrown away the number that was one more than that. So you keep throwing away the largest number you can, and that will give you your decomposition. And with a little bit of work, you can show that you can't have two different decompositions as a sum of non-adjacent Fibonacci's. It's a nice exercise to show that. Okay, so I assume people have seen this definition of the Fibonacci's before. It's the sum of the previous two. It turns out an alternative way to define the Fibonacci's is they are the unique sequence of integers 
such that every number can be written as a sum of non-adjacent terms of the sequence. So let's start off with the number one, okay? Let's try to write two as a sum of non-adjacent terms in the sequence. Well, I've only got one, so I've got to add two to my sequence. All right, so now I've got one and two. I want to get three. I can't do one plus two because they're adjacent, so I have to add three. Now I have one, two, three, and I want to get four. Can I write four as a sum of non-adjacent Fibonacci numbers? Yeah, one plus three, but I can't do five. You know, three plus two, nope, not allowed. And three plus one is too small. So I have to add five. So now I have one, two, three, five. Can I get six? Yeah, five plus one is six. Can I get seven? Yes, five plus two is seven. I can't get eight. So I have to add eight as the next term. So it's a nice exercise you can prove that this is an alternative definition of the Fibonacci numbers. And you'll see that you, you can now get 9, 10, 11, 12, and you have to add 13. So there's this nice interplay between definitions of legal decompositions and recurrence relations. You have seen stuff like this before, but it hasn't been uh, emphasized. Uh, can anybody tell me why we like to use base 10? If so, please raise your hands. <laughs> right, we've got 10 fingers, right? We like to use base 10 because we have 10 fingers. That's just the recurrence relation, you know, a n plus one is 10 times a n. This is very similar to a decimal notation, but now instead of using the recurrence relation, a n plus one is 10 a n, we're using a different recurrence relation and we have a different notion of what does it mean to be legal. You can't use two adjacent terms and you can either use a term once or not at all. Okay. So the next thing you can ask is, well, there's many ways we can write numbers as sums of Fibonacci. I can write 18 as 13 plus five or 13 plus three plus two. It turns out if you look at all the different ways to write a number as a sum of Fibonacci, the fewest summons will always be from the second of decomposition. It's possible that you could have a decomposition that has as few summons as the second of, but nothing will ever have fewer. So for instance, if I give you um, 16, I can write 16 as eight plus eight or as 13 plus three. So they both have two summons. Nothing is gonna have fewer summons than the second door. And you can ask what other recurrence relations have this kind of uniqueness property with their legal decompositions. So I'm not gonna go into you know, detail on that, but I will quickly talk about why the second door decomposition uh, is summoned minimal. And then we will see how we can make a game from this. Well, it shouldn't surprise you that I'm going to attach a monovariance to the problem, given that this is a talk on monovariance. And so if I can write N as a sum of AK, FK, so FK is my kth Fibonacci, AK is how many times I have it, I'm going to associate to this decomposition, what I'll call the index of the decomposition, the sum of AK times the square root of K. When you see the square root of k, you're like, really? Why, why can't you just do ak times k? It turns out you can do ak times k, but it makes things a little bit harder because it's not always going to be strictly decreasing. This makes things strictly decreasing. It's just a little bit more algebra. Uh, has anybody ever heard the phrase Tanstoffel? All right, Tanstoffel, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. You have to pay for something somewhere. Where do you want to pay? I can have a slightly worse definition of my monovariant, but now I'm gonna have something that's strictly decreasing, or I can have the more natural definition and it's no longer gonna be strictly decreasing and I have to do a little bit more algebra. It's purely a question of where do you want to do the algebra? It turns out that without too much trouble, you can show that there's only a finite number of decompositions we need to consider for given n. I'm clearly never going to use an index larger than n, because then the Fibonacci number would be larger than my number. And none of the a k's can ever be larger than n. So there's only finitely many possible configurations that could work for any given number. And then what you do is you show that this index is a monovariant, and you show that you'll always end in the second door of decomposition. And as you travel from whatever decomposition you started with to the second door, you just show that you never increase the number of summits. So there's two ways that you could not be a second of decomposition. You could have some index twice, or you could have two adjacent ones. And then you go through and you just do the algebra. Well, what would happen in each case? Well, if I had two adjacent ones and I replace it with the next one, I look at, well, I had a root k plus a root k plus one, and you show that that's greater than the square root of k plus two. 
So the total value of the index went down when I did the swap. If you had something doubled and you replace it uh, by switching things out, you again show that it's going to decrease things. You've got to be a little bit careful to take with one or two things are a little bit hard because of how the Fibonacci start. The Fibonacci numbers, I know we said are going to be one, two, three, but they're really not one, two, three. They're really zero, one, one, two, three. And we have to play some little games like that at the very beginning. It's a small amount of algebra. It's not too bad. It shows you that you have a monovariant. Okay, I'm not gonna go through in general, but just for the professors who are in the audience who really you know, care, if you look at recurrence relations in more general form, if I have that the coefficients are integers and you the, oh, it's really bad that they do. And the coefficients are strictly decreasing. So C1 less than equal to C2 less than equal to C3, uh, you can then show that you will have a unique decomposition. And I did this with some of my RU students a couple of years ago. All right. So what I want to do for the last part of the talk. Oh, yes. Yes, that's right. Uh, for the uh, connections here. Yes. Um, and so, um, and then she went to Carnegie Mellon. Carnegie Mellon. Yes. Just getting her PhD. Just getting her PhD there. Summer. Yes. Yep. I remember visiting her very recently. All right. So now we're going to switch to the Zeckendorf game. So this is the game that I created. If you can find out how to win, I will pay you $500. I am open to paying you $1,000. If you want to go more than that, uh, my daughter is trying to get me to do a crazy fuse bead project that would involve 360,000 fuse beads. So given what she's trying to do to me, uh, I am quite willing to invest money in uh, having something to go against her. So if you can find a way to look at this, and again, it is possible. That's what I love about these projects. You do not need advanced mathematics. You do not need five years of graduate school and your research experience. It's, can you look at things the right way? For the Conway checkerboard problem, how many of you have taken calculus? Yeah, not using calculus. How many of you have taken any classes beyond calc? Not using any of that either. You know, all we're using is essentially the geometric series converges. We can do this in algebra one or two. It's can you look at things the right way? And that's what I love about this. Can you look at it the right way? So if you find the right way to look at this, which is possible, uh, I'd be very happy. So we're gonna play a two player game. The last person to move is going to win. And the bins are going to be the Fibonacci numbers, F1, F2, F3. And we're gonna choose a positive integer N and we'll put N pieces in the first bin and everything else will be empty. And then a turn consists of one of two things. If you have two pieces on FK, what you can do is you can replace it with a piece on FK plus one and a piece on FK minus two. So think of it as I have two pieces on the eight Fibonacci number. Eight plus eight is 16. 16 is 13 plus three. 13 is the next Fibonacci number after eight. Three is two ones before that. That's what this rule is basically saying is if you have a Fibonacci number that's doubled, you can replace it with something that's one above and two below. And you have to tweak it a little bit if you're at one or two. You have two things on two, two plus two is four, that's three plus one. If you have two things on one, then that actually just becomes one thing on F2 and something on the zero and we forget about the zero. The other move you can do, which is a little bit simpler, is if I have pieces on two consecutive Fibonacci numbers, say the eight and the 13, I can replace it with one piece on the 21. And the questions that you can ask about this are, does the game end? And if so, after how long? Uh, for each end, who has the winning strategy? And then what is the winning strategy? So imagine you- This question, this is like the total sum stays the same. The total sum stays the same, exactly. Yeah, okay. uh, and we're gonna see very shortly that the game will always end in the second of decomposition. So when you play this, you will always end in the second of decomposition, but the number of turns it takes to get to the second of decomposition can change. So you can ask questions about what's the fastest game? What's the slowest game? Anybody know what national event is gonna happen in 2024? Election, <laughs> right? Imagine I can tell uh, your favorite candidate that good news, I've done the theoretical work, I can prove that you can win the election in 2024? What are they gonna ask? No. Okay, and I said, well, I, I'm a theoretician. It's an existence proof. 
that's not as useful as saying, here's the constructive proof of what you should do to get to a winning coalition. We're going to see, unfortunately, uh, for each n greater than two, player two has the winning strategy, but it is a non-constructive proof. I want a constructive proof so I can beat my daughter. That's the question. I, so let's actually play a game. So let's start off with 10 pieces on the one bins. We've got one, two, three, five, and eight. Okay, I don't need the 13 because I'm never gonna have 13 as one of the summons in the decomposition. So there's only one possible opening move. I take two things on the one and put something on the two. And so once I do that, I now have eight pieces on the one, one piece on the two, and zero everywhere else. Now I have two possibilities. I could again take two things on the one and put something on the two, or I could take a one and a two and give me a three. Let's take two pieces on the one and put something on the two. So now I'll have six, two, zero, zero, zero. And again, I have a couple of possible moves. I could take two things on the one and make a two. I could take a one and a two and make a three, or I could split a two and get a one and a three. Let's split a two and get a one and a three. And so now I would have seven, zero, one. And as was remarked, seven times one plus zero times two plus one times three still adds up to 10. So the total sum is always gonna be the same. Well, at this point, I only have one possible move. I have to take two ones and make it um, a two. And now at this point, I've got a couple of moves. Let's say I take the two and the three and I make it a four. So I'm gonna be five, zero, zero, one, zero. Again, I now only have one possible move and we just you know, keep playing the game like this. And so you know, again, I'll just go through a bunch of moves and I'll just you know, summarize the table at the end as to what happens. All right, and so these are just the bin numbers down here, one, two, three, five, eight. And here is a list of in parentheses, you know, whose turn it is. Player one starts with 10 things over here and they moved and now it's player two's turn and this is the configuration. And after player two moves, player one is facing this configuration. When you look at this table, something should seem a little bit strange about how this table is written. You know, when you just look at this, this is not how you normally format tables. What looks strange in this table? I do have the labels at the bottom. I could put the labels up top, but I was afraid they were gonna, things were gonna be cut off and I didn't want things that really mattered to be cut off. When we look at the table, something seems strange when you're looking at it. There's a gap. There's a gap. So over here, it was player two's turn. And what player two chose to do uh, was they took a one and one of the pieces here and made a three. They could have done something else. What else could they have done? So they could have taken the two and they could have split it. So if we do it like this, player one is moving, two is moving, one is moving, two, one, two, one, two, one is moving. And when they get to here, there's no moves left. So player one has triumphed. If instead player two were to do the move of splitting the two, now that changes it and now player two has triumphed. So this shows you that sometimes player one can win, sometimes player two can win. And so the question is, who has the winning strategy? And so the first theorem is all games end in finitely many moves. It's good to know that this game is going to end. And what you do is you show that the value is a monovariant and it is in fact strictly decreasing. So every time you play, every time you do a move, the value of the board of this index goes down. And since there's only finitely many decompositions you can have because we can't use anything larger than index n, we can't have more than n copies of anything, we know the game is going to have to end because we can't go through infinitely many things always getting down. There's not gonna be an infinite descent. The game value goes down it's strictly decreasing. There's only finitely many possibilities. We've got to get to a point where no more moves are available. And when we hit that, we have to be in the second door of decomposition. If we would in the second door of decomposition, then there would have been a move available. So all games will end in a finite number of times and they'll end in the second door of decomposition. As mathematicians, you can then start proving results about, can you tell me something about how long the games will take? 
Can you give me upper bounds? Can you give me lower bounds? You know, there's lots of things you can do. What if you just played a random game? What if you just take moves at random? We believe that the number of moves is gonna be a Gaussian in terms of counting all the different parts. We can't prove this yet, but we're getting closer. I think we've now been able to prove that half the time the games have an even length and half the times the games have an odd length. So what I wanna to end today with is I wanna to show to you that player two has a winning strategy. And I will give you a non-constructive proof. Uh, so if you've never seen non-constructive game theory before, it's a interesting subject. So I'm gonna start with the game. I've heard this game called Chomp. I don't know if anybody has seen this one before. So the way it works is you choose a circle and then you eat that circle with everything above and everything to the right. Whoever goes last loses. If it was whoever goes last wins, where would you go on your first turn? Lower left, right? And the game would not be that hard to analyze. So for this one, whoever goes last loses. So I'm going to prove to you that player one always has a winning strategy. So there are going to be two possibilities. One possibility is for given board, player one has a winning strategy. Well, if so, player one should play it. Or imagine we have a board where player one does not have the winning strategy. So player two has the winning strategy. What we want to do is we want to show that player one can steal the winning strategy. So imagine player one goes in the upper right corner. So the only chomp, the only thing that's eaten is the upper right dot. Well, by assumption, we're in a configuration where player two has the winning strategy. So no matter what player one does, there has to be a winning move available for player two. I can't draw an arbitrary thing on the board. I apologize, I'm not that gifted. So I will just assume for definiteness that this is where player two needs to go or one of the places player two can go and stay on the path towards victory. And now player one acts like a five-year-old. He says, oh wait, no, 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 I didn't mean to go there. I meant to go here. I meant to go where you went. That's what I want my first move to be. And I'm taking, I'm taking backsies. I'm taking that as my move now. And so if player two had the winning move after player one went here and then player two went there, well, if player one just goes there initially, we've got the same board configuration, but we've changed whose turn it is. And player one has successfully stolen the winning strategy. The difficulty is we don't know where player two is supposed to go. So this is a non-constructive proof. We don't know how player one can get to the winning strategy. We just know that there has to be a winning strategy. Right, so I've got, I think about on the order of five minutes left, which should be enough time to quickly highlight the uh, proof of this. Uh, to give you a sense of what kind of person I am, my thesis student who came up with this argument was told that if my daughter beats you at your thesis defense, because I'm going to pull her from school for this, you don't graduate. <laughs> and so, you know, I go to a small liberal arts college, we get to know our students really well, and so my daughter was game. And my daughter got to go second, and she realized at one point that she made the wrong move. And she, and I saw, you know, you, you made it, you know, she's gonna graduate. And so she did graduate, she went on, got a nice law degree and is doing quite well. So here's the notation. The exponent is going to be how many copies of the Fibonacci number that I have. So this is N copies of one. This is N minus two copies of one and one copy of a two. Over here, it's N minus eight copies of one, one, two, and three twos. And if you notice, uh, if you multiply the exponents by the numbers and add, it's always going to sum to n. So this is going to be how the game evolves. So the game starts off very boring. You know, the only possible opening move is to go from n copies of one to n minus two copies of one and one copy of two. But then after that, we then have two possible next moves. I can take a one and a two and make a three, or I can take two ones and give myself an extra two. What I'm going to do is I will color things Wow, I mean, uh, let, let's see if your eyesight is good. If you have good eyesight, you should see that what it's projecting is not the color that I have on my iPad. So we'll call that, I think, a pinkish on the screen that's being projected. For those of you who are watching the YouTube video later, it's more like an orangish. But we'll color things pink if player one has the winning strategy and blue if player two has the winning strategy. Let's assume player one has the winning strategy. So player one goes here, we start the game. And now after player one's first move, we end up down one and player one still has to have the winning strategy. No matter what player two does, 
player one is still going to have the winning strategy. Well, so that means whichever move player two does, I'm going to have to color it pink. And so for definiteness, I'm going to focus on the left-hand side, the n minus three copies of one and the one copy of three. You have to do a similar analysis for the other side, but it's not so bad. Now, things are actually pretty nice. If I have n minus three copies of one and one three, there's only one move that player one can do at this point. So I know that's still gonna be colored pink. You know, once you have more than one move, you know, if I was on the right-hand side, there were three possible moves. It's possible that one of them might've been a bad move for player one, but on this chain, it's easy. So now I'm over here, player two gets to go, no matter where player two goes by assumption, we're assuming player one has the winning strategy. So they all get colored pink. And now things are more complicated. I have lots of different places where I am. I have lots of different moves that I can do. But by assumption, I'm assuming player one has a winning strategy. So there's gotta be uh, some point. So at the very top, player one was going, then player two, player one, player two, player one is going, we come down here. And let's say we move to this square where we have uh, N minus five copies of one and one copy of five. So here, player one was moving, player two, player one, player two, player one, player two. Now it's player two's turn to go. But notice a moment ago at the previous level, we had a different person going at the same configuration. And we said, that's a winning configuration for player one, the person who's going. That means we have to color this blue. And so you can then have things propagate around and propagate back up. And you can see that you're going to get to a uh, contradiction. And so there is a way for player two to steal the win. So the assumption that player one had the winning strategy is wrong. Now again, this is not going through all the cases. You would never want a speaker to do that in a talk like this. You want enough to just get a sense of what's going on. And so I'm gonna skip the journalized game um, and just you know, talk very briefly about you know, some current work. You can have more, you know, whenever you see anything in math, always ask, how can I journalize this? How can I push this further? What if we had more people playing? Especially what if you start to have alliances among people, what can happen? Uh, what happens if you just play the games randomly? Uh, can you say things about how long games take? We recently proved that the number of possible moves in the game is actually a closed interval. Uh, has anybody here seen the 3x plus one problem? Okay, if you have not seen it, I don't necessarily want to tell you it right now. Uh, the two best quotes I know about it are uh, Paul Erdős, mathematics is not yet ready for problems like this, or Kakatani, this is a Soviet conspiracy to slow down American mathematics. It sounds so doable and people have spent so much time and frustration on it. If you really want to do this to yourself, I will talk to you afterwards about what is the 3x plus one problem. But there's two ways to do the 3x plus one problem. You can multiply by three and add one if you're odd, or you can pull out as many powers of, and then you divide by two if you're even. Or you can do it all in one step and pull out as many powers of two as you can. And that's the accelerated 3x plus one problem. You could try to do things over here. What if we allow ourselves more moves? What if you have say six copies on the eighth Fibonacci number. Can I have myself split it one time, two times, three times, or four times? What if you allow something like that so you now have more possible moves? You're still gonna end up in the second of decomposition, but now the strategies become far more interesting. So, you know, again, there's lots of things you can do. What other recurrences can you do this for? For a lot of things, the Fibonacci numbers happen to be a really nice recurrence to work with. There are some other games where we can play this, but it's not always clear that the games will end. So we have one game that we think we know what's going on, except we can't prove that the game actually will end. We believe it will, but we can't prove that yet. And so if anybody can come up with a constructive strategy for player two, I would love to see this. And so this is you know, joint with you know, many students over the years. It is a absolutely great example of you're know, taking a concept in mathematics like monovariance, does not require a tremendous amount, but finding a good way to use it. I love looking for problems like this for undergraduate research. I also do stuff in analytic number theory with zeros of zeta functions. You wanna do something like that, happy to do that with you as well. But these are extremely accessible. And if you wanna try your hand at some summer research, even if you have something else you're doing over the summer, you are welcome to apply to the polymath program and try your hand at some research.
And again, I will be happy to say more about this afterwards. So thank you. <laughs>